Hi, everyone. Welcome to Greylock's Conversations. I'm Reed Hoffman. Today, I am thrilled to have my friend J.J. Abrams with us. J.J. is the co-founder and co-director of Bad Robot Productions, which has been the force behind some of the most successful and well-known films and TV shows of our time. Bad Robot has brought us modern sci-fi hits like Super 8, Star Wars, Star Trek, and the Cloverfield franchises, and shows like Alias, Felicity, Lost, and Westworld. While relatively few tech entrepreneurs may work on products that end up being household names, like JJ's creations, there is a lot of overlap between how he and people in his world operate and how those, how, how those of us in the tech ecosystem do as well. One of the parallels that I find most fascinating is how we are all seeking to change reality in some form and the way we bring our ideas to fruition. For JJ and others in media, this means creating compelling characters and stories who exist in alternate worlds. For the tech world, that means creating products that, ha that have or might fundamentally transform everyday life. In that regard, science fiction and real world technology continually take inspiration from one another. Similarly, anyone whose work impacts society at great levels carries a great responsibility. We'll spend most of today's discussion exploring those themes. JJ will share how he and Bad Robot develop ideas into stories, and we'll discuss how science fiction and games have inspired products and sometimes even companies in the nonfiction real world and vice versa. We'll also hear about JJ's own path to becoming an entrepreneur and company builder and how he approaches each project like a startup in and of itself. If anyone is interested in a deeper dive behind the story an on the story behind Bad Robot, you can check out my interview with JJ on Masters of Scale, which we did recently. So JJ is like, didn't we already do this? Um, a note to our audience, as we go through this event, uh, please, please feel free to ask questions in the chat function. I'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, bear in mind, just like any of us working in stealth mode, there's a limit on how much insider details JJ can share about future projects. Uh, with that, let's get started. JJ, thanks so much, as always, for being here. Uh, Reed, it's great to see you, and thank you for that uh, incredibly generous intro. As I told you, because uh, uh, you know JJ and I've been friends for a long time, I was like, "This is going to embarrass you a little bit," but it's worth saying. So that's well, that, that's how very, I very, very sweet of you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, like all good nerds, um, you know, uh, both you and I have always loved science fiction and games, um, and also like good nerds, um, they've informed a lot of my thinking about real world technology and business strategy, and the same is true for many tech entrepreneurs. And also, of course, true for today's tech and real world events and inspiring sci-fi, science fiction and media. So, you know, I know that you think about this a lot because, you know, part of uh, what I, you know, I think part of how we first met is you started kind of scratching at and trying to figure out what's actually going on, what should be the real basis uh, for some of the better kind of stories in this. And that was one of the things that you take very seriously. So what's, what's some of the inspiration that you've kind of taken from tech and some of that process that you do for generating these amazing stories? Uh, well, thank you again. I, you know, I, I think that the answer is, is maybe super obvious, but I'll, I'll say it, which is I think that it is very much a, a, a two-way street. I think that the, um, I remember when we were shooting uh, one of our Star Trek films, we were shooting um, at, at Livermore Labs and we were, we were at the National Ignition Facility and, and almost to a researcher, they were coming over to us and saying, oh my God, I got into this because of Star Trek. And now you're shooting Star Trek here. And we're like, well, we're shooting Star Trek here because this looks like what we thought Star Trek should look like. You know, And I think that there are a lot of examples of, you know, that we just take for granted. Um, looking back at things, again, super obvious, but 2001, when you see the technology that exists there, when you look at, you know, it could be anything from, you know, the Dick Tracy comic strips, um, you know, and 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 his uh, his communication watch to obviously the Star Trek communicator. Uh, I think that what what I or people like myself have have been inspired to consider or to do or think was perhaps even you know inevitable, and therefore I'm going to make it real. Um, the list is long, and 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 obviously uh, reaching out to you, you've been always incredibly uh, generous, uh, also in connecting me with other people as well who could help. You know just have a discussion and and give me a sense of what uh you know what else i might be looking at or considering or thinking about because obviously for i think all of us the list of things that we might not know is 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 far longer than what we do 
Well, one of the things that I, I love about the way that you approach science fiction is a lot of times people think of science fiction as about the technology. And for you, it's about the humanity and the story with the science and the technology there. Um, it's actually one of the reasons I think you're, you know, kind of being mo so multidisciplinary and how you think about it is good. What are the ways in which this kind of interface with the science and technology is, is having you think about how it affects our humanity? Like what's, what's the, you know, whether it's AI or synthetic biology or the network, you know, kind of how, how is that weaving into your storytelling? Well, it's funny because there are some times where, for example, when we're working on, on Star Wars, I personally don't consider Star Wars to be science fiction as much as I feel it is just a great adventure and kind of like a serial, you know, drama uh, fantasy. And, um, and so it's funny, like certain times, you know, science can uh, be the, the greatest gift. And some of my favorite stories are ones that take a scientific notion and and then ask what if and push it one step further and there's usually that one area where it's kind of like obfuscating the kind of like that 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 membrane that, that gets you know permeated that, that then you cross over into the impossible but you do it all through the, the the what is possible so for example when you know Shelley wrote Frankenstein and had you know lightning the power of lightning hit you know and, and and that was sort of like in the magic of lightning that thing happened you know uh Crichton did it certainly uh with with Jurassic Park and the notion of you know what if you know in in genetics that you know what if we took what we know and said would it be possible to if in amber you know etc so I I love the idea of science pushing and creating opportunities but I feel like um my favorite movies that I've ever seen and and stories I've read are ones where there's something that is that is that we know to be true that is real mm -hmm. and 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 somehow at some point almost invisibly we've crossed over into the this is either not possible uh or you know <laughs> not likely at all but we are now in the thing that makes it the story that you know we we all know and love what and, and again there are so many examples of what those stories are yeah no exactly and and, you know, like, for example, um, like diving into Westworld, which was this kind of question about, you know, what is it to be human and what are the, you know, kind of um, identity, free will, determination, sure. um, ethics, um, you know, like, you, you, yes, there is like real things about creating robots and AI. But, you know, what you're really telling is this entire story that plays out all of these very canonical human tendencies. Well, it's funny because the the... You know, Michael Crichton, when when he when he made Westworld, uh, and when I was a kid and saw it, and I had a meeting with Crichton um, now twenty five years ago uh, about this. Um, you know, it, it it was of course, you know, a mostly fantastical notion, and 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 it was all you know, uh, sort of taking what what he knew to be true and asking what if, like you know, like we're saying. Um, but for me, the thing that struck me was that that feeling of, of I, I felt for as, as much as Yul Brenner's character terrified the hell out of me, you know, I, I, I weirdly felt for that, that character and those characters. And there was that kind of, you know, the dynamic between James Brolin and Richard Benjamin in that film, there was that element of, of, you know, it, it, it was at the core about a kind of an ethical question. And, and what I, I, you know, I, I have to give 100% of the credit to Westworld, to uh, Jonah Nolan and Lisa Joy, who took this on. I, I did pitch the, the idea to HBO and sell the, the, the premise, which, which for me was about oppression, and it was about the everything you just mentioned, um, and, and it was really about uh, being aligned with people who come to realize their life is not what they think it is, and they realize that they are, in fact, imprisoned in and the creations of an entity that is you know and then of course the question becomes well who isn't uh on some level but but jonah and lisa took this idea that hbo uh bought and they made it literal and and brought it to life in a way that you know i think is is really remarkable and 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 so I, you know i love the idea of um coming to a story from the you know the the human point of view, the, the the character that you are that you love, not to say that that character can't also be 
something of uh, technology and of the science. One funny intersection that I think it may be fun to share with people, um, and I think this is fine because it's historic, um, but to ask is, I remember having this conversation with you when it was, you were startled at how fast Reddit had figured out the plot twist. That it was like, mm. you guys are like, we haven't really foreshadowed it that much. We've only just, you know, yeah. like just hinted well, at it. Well, it was funny that, that you know, that when Jonah and Lisa that were pitching out what they were doing in that first season and that there was this uh, this time differential and the, and, the, and the idea that we were intercutting scenes, but what you come to realize later is that you had been watching something completely asynchronous and, and you know, out of time. It, it was one of those things that when they were pitching it and then when they got to it, I was like, holy crap, that is just so good. Um, and it was, I think within a couple episodes or a few episodes that, that people online had, had, you know, in that sort of amazing, uh, hive mind, unstoppable way, um, come to con you know conclude you know who the man in black was and what we were watching, and I was like, oh my god, like like, I, and I just think it's it, it, it's it's part of the fun of that is what you hope to do is something that anyone will, uh, you know, hypothesize where it might be going and what it might mean, and and so it was it wasn't a you know anything but um, exciting to see people getting what Joan and Lisa were doing. Yep. So, um, you know, you you grew up around the entertainment industry, um, you know, love of film and TV, you know, on master scale, we covered that that amazing Steven Spielberg. Let, let's let's do the the Super 8 uh, side. And that set the foundation for the career path. But but what made what made, was it was science fiction the way to approach humanity or the way to approach the possible? Um, you know, was was that the thing that kind of made science fiction a lot of what you're doing? Not all of anything, but a lot. Or was it works of science fiction? What was it? I think for for me, the, you know, I I rarely think of things in terms of of what genre is it, a, as opposed to what is the kind of ooh factor, the like, oh my god, that's I want to see that, or wow, what if what if I were there? What if my family were? You know, there's a kind of vicarious wish fulfillment, you know, uh, or cautionary tale aspect that science fiction is, you know, uh, it, it's a wonderful way to talk about who we are and where we are without being literal about it. Um, you know, when we did Cloverfield, which is, you know, a big, crazy uh, monster movie that Matt Reeves directed, um, you know, that was very much a, you know, it was, it was a post- 9-11 sort of, uh, you know, it was a way of dealing with trauma in the city that wasn't the literal thing, you know, and mm -hmm. we had a lot of, you know, conversations about that. And I feel like science fiction just lends itself to, and obviously Gene Roddenberry was, was sort of wonderful at uh, commenting on who we, who we are and, and, and societal ills and questions he had and issues that he had just the way Rod Serling was in you know the twilight zone because i mean rod serling famously had written stories that were not genre stories they were these literal stories about race or politics uh or the cold war or you know um you know and any number of of things that just incited you know uh rage with the sponsors and the, the networks and he got in trouble all the time and it was and finally the twilight zone was a way of saying i'm going to tell every story i want to but they're going to be aliens or it's going to be science fiction, or it's going to be something. Else. And he and everything was metaphor. And 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 I think that science fiction genre in general, I think, lends itself so well to that. Yeah, no, I I, I completely agree, and it's part of the humanity. How do you see like your like one of your you you, you actually do um, you you have a broad palette. Everyone's very familiar with the film and TV. Um, there's little funny things like creating the boring logo for. Elon and, and, you know, cause your palette includes making hats, <laughs> right. And sending them over. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's a very broad palette. One of the questions we're getting from the audience is how do you look at the differences between um, uh, kind of uh, movies and film and this kind of linear and interactive like games? Uh, do mm -hmm. you think that the, do you, do you also kind of play in that palette? And do you think that palette has some interesting strengths and weaknesses relative to the film and TV? For sure, um, it's a great question. You know, we we just recently uh, started uh, Bad Robot Games, um, 
sort of officially getting it off the ground uh, with Anna Sweet um, at the head of it. And, and I feel like we've got this, uh, this is something we, we're talking about quite a bit. Um, and in fact, the the idea of of the company uh, is, the, you know, the sort of the, 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 the mission statement is, is to continually uh, uh, redefine how stories are played. And the idea that we are like, you know, that, that, that a story is, is, is critical. And yet, you know, when you're playing a game, it, it's hard to argue that gameplay is the most important thing. And then of course, there's the question of, are you telling a story or are you being told a story? And, and how much does one want to play a game to be told a story? And how much does one want agency to be telling the story? And, and, not, you know, there's no one answer for every game. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that a, a gamer can, you know, can play. And uh, so it, we're always in, you know, healthy debate, I think, about what it is to um, to tell a story when it is interactive. Because a story, by definition, I think, is something that has an inevitability and a moral. And you're and and you're you're telling the story for a sort of purpose. And and how do you know? what it is you are uh, setting up if you don't know how you are paying it off. And in a game, unless it is a, a, a hierarchy where you are sort of hiding the fact that there is inevitably, you know, you're always sending people to these particular places, which is a familiar uh, approach to it, you know, it's very hard to give particular meaning to a moment if you don't understand how it's going to come back later. And so I think that, that you know, I, I love games and of all, all kinds. And I think that some games lend themselves really well to expanding worlds that have a narrative. So you can kind of feel like you're part of something, even though it's not a literal. I think one of the, one of the errors of, you know, that we've seen uh, is that, is that in, whether it's in a sort of cash grab way or an, you know, an opportunistic way, movies have been made to kind of try and, recreate what you experience playing the game, which immediately pisses off the people who play because they're like, don't tell me what my game is. And, and, and games have been made because it's like, oh, let's do that again, but in a game and put the person in there. But the truth is, unless it's in the real context of the, the movie, some of those sequences end up just sort of being a bit rote. And to me, the fun of it is saying, well, what if you took the spirit of that movie and said, what could a great game be on its own but it happens to live in that universe. And then you can start to seed ideas back and forth and you can start to, you know, uh, it, they can be additive, you know, cross-directionally. And I, that to me is something that's very exciting. Do you think you're going to try, I mean, this may be too predictive and too early, but um, to actually have games that have that same kind of emotional, like, you know, kind of like, this is the moral of the story. This is kind of, this is the lens, this is the, the catalyst of the perspective. Well, I think it's happened. I mean, like, you know, when, when you play The Last of Us, it's like that is a deeply moving, emotional and thrilling experience. You know, th th there are games out there that 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 do that. It, of course, like like anything, uh, it is both hard to do. Those are few and far between when they're like at that sort of level of of narrative. A and I think it's it's a pretty n nascent means of telling those kind of stories. And I think that as uh as sort of as it becomes clear what kind of narratives work best interactively and as the technology you know continues to evolve in a way and obviously like we're all seeing with things like you know Un unreal engine 5 and you see not just what is possible in in real time rendering but that literally the, the tools that are being used to create real time games are the tools that are being used to create the movies and shows that we see i mean it is becoming one conversation and i think if you look at technology and and creation whether it's you know graphics or or music or nonlinear editing, there's a kind of fluidity between programs and techniques that has kind of obviated the the need to even say Renaissance person because a Renaissance person used to be someone who like oh did all these things we're now born into doing all these things like like kids now don't know the difference between you know listening to music and the ability to make it because they all know they can. The, the, the thing that they got comes with a thing that lets them, you know. Um, so I, I feel like the, the you know, for me, I, I, I feel like the, where we're going with, with games will invariably lead to those kind of emotional mm -hmm. stories increasingly. Yep. No, that makes total sense. 
Um, so let's shift a little to process and let's start with kind of a funny thing that uh, well, I was witness to, which is, you know, I invited you up to this oh, group no. CEO dinner. What are you talk about? Yes. <laughs> well, the, remember the CEO <laughs> dinner we had in, in San Mateo? Yeah, of course. Uh, where yeah. was the Apollo fusion, uh, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the guys working on fusion. And, you know, yeah. I kind of made sure that you were sitting next to some of the interesting people, uh, you know, creating new things. And this was like, we're making fusion in our garage, you know, kind of thing <laughs> as a way of, 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 of making yeah. it entertaining. And, yeah. and it was funny because one of the things you, you were asking a whole bunch of questions because you're like, hmm, this story kind of writes itself. Um, how often do you encounter this kind of like suddenly bizarre, like just like, hmm, the truth is stranger than fiction story that starts inspiring you? And can you share a few of those moments? Well, I'll say that, you know, I think we all, you know, not just people who are, you know, uh, storytellers, but like, and I think on some level everyone is, uh, you know, but but we all certainly in in my line of work, we all love the idea of, of Doc Brown or Seth Brundle or, who, you know, being real. Like you want those people to really exist. And you kind of find out that they do because when, like, I remember when we were doing Fringe, the weirder, you know, the story we came up with, the weirdest thing that we might come up with um, in, in any given, you know, week or month, we would almost invariably hear something a week later that was weirder, that was actually happening. That, that might be similar, it might be weirdly the same. The stuff that, you know, and it's not to say that that kind of, um, you know, pushing at science fiction, extreme, um, sort of X Files territory stuff is 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 common, but you you do find that people are in their garages dreaming up and and coming up with any number of incredible things, including obviously in the category of of genetics, which I think is going to end up being, as most people I think know, uh, going to be this wild west of I think very hard to comprehend. Um, advancements and 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 accessibility i think that the, the thing that's so crazy about that is is how you're not going to need a giant infrastructure or, or corporate you know uh support to create your own uh you know insect or species so i just feel like there's a lot of, of weirdness around the corner and in fact something that we're working on right now not specifically about genetics but just kind of embracing the, the feeling of between genetics and robotics and ai and all this that's happening that feeling that we are on the precipice of the kind of uh, the kind of inventions that I think will be very hard for people to swallow or comprehend, uh, and and I just that's for someone who does what I do is an opportunity because it feels like there is that sense of things are getting weird. They're kind of going to get weirder, and and what doors does that open, and what can we put a family through? <laughs> And how do you inform what the humanity of it is? I mean, like I, I had a conversation with one of the leading geneticists where I was like, well, how are we going to make these decisions about, you know, how to, uh, you know, kind of like uh, begin to approach, you know, uh, genetics as design, you know, versus just, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of editorial filter. And he said, oh, yeah, I, I could see us deciding like you add some jellyfish to your genetics and you know i'm gonna add some you know kind of um you know bald eagle to mine and so forth. And you're like well, you know my you can see the smoke or the steam coming out of my ears going whoa yeah, <laughs> yeah. no right. it it, it, it like, is, what is it yeah. well i i do think that the the it, it, it's 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 a funny thing I, I i doodle a lot and i will often draw like a circle and shade it as a sphere and shadow it and everything and then i'll i'll just draw some like a little figure on it or you know next to it or climbing up it and it's just weird how the when you put in you know an anthropomorphized figure into or a human figure into any kind of situation suddenly it becomes interesting not not just three-dimensional but it becomes relatively connected to you and i just feel like everything you're describing um if you put a person next to anything you just said, it's interesting. Like, what is it yeah. when you are, you know, when when someone is uh, adjacent to, in the center of, involved in, you know, in the periphery of something, you know, spectacular uh, or something potentially frightening or something that mysterious that we don't know. I and and that is the place that I think to go back to Crichton again because he just he did it so well. 
that feeling of of you know taking people that you come to connect with and then saying oh and this happened and you know and this yeah. is what's going on and and they've done that you know and then it's just you know then 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 the answer to that question i think uh becomes apparent which is you know what like what does it say about us and of course it depends on what the story is but it, it starts to become clear yep so so one um of the many areas of overlap um uh, the, the the work you do and the work that the silicon valley folks do um is talent right because obviously you know a lot of your job these days is not actually architecting the story or anything else but is assembling the teams and helping catalyze them and and make sure they're you know kind of like motivated the right way what's some of the things that that you kind of learned is kind of you know your thoughts and inspirations and rules around talent that 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 are you know our, our tech group uh, might be uh, super curious about well, you know, I, there's obviously no, um, there are no rules that one can really follow t to do anything. I think that, you know, every day, whenever, whenever we're shooting something and, and I, I kind of, a day's coming up and I'm like, oh, I think this is going to go, I, I know what, I know what we're going to do. This is going to be great. Uh, invariably, it kicks my ass that day. And when I go into a day and I'm like, God damn, this is going to be a bear. I don't know. Weirdly, it kind of works. And I just, I, I, I don't know. Um, how to predict or how to, but I will say in terms of talent, um, primarily I think it's, it's we all want to be, be taken on a ride and we want to find people who have something and it can be in any, you know, uh, concentration, any area that inspires, that makes us feel something. And, and I, I, I've talked about this with you before, but the, the thing that I kind of rely on for that is this sixth sense that we all have, which is the chills. Like when you get the chills when someone shows you something talks about something describes something like you listen to something that they've done you can't like when you feel that thing it is not you can't have a conversation about it's like it's that's telling you it's it's the universe saying yeah yeah, yeah that so there's that thing um i think a critical thing i have found and you know obviously um at, at bad robot we have a, a bunch of approaches to this but it's become really valuable uh and it is a value for us which is to make sure that the people that we're working with, the talent we're bringing in, don't always look like us. That they're people who come from different experiences, different backgrounds, um, and that has been a priceless thing for 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 us um, to work with with people who don't just shake their head and or nod or say yeah, well, let's do that thing, but but say yeah, but what if or what about? In my experience, you know, and and. And those are things that are really invaluable because I think increasingly people are finding themselves looking for, and especially by the way, now in this ecosystem of 10 million new shows uh, an hour, you're, they're, lo you know, they're looking for stories that don't feel like same old, same old. So I think finding people who are you know, inspiring, finding people who are uh, not the usual suspects uh, is, is key. And I also think that you know I I tend I do tend to work with a lot of the same people again and again, uh, but I also feel like it, it has become a a, a huge uh, part of what we do at Bad Robot to expand our horizons and learn from not just the younger generation uh, of storytellers and, and and filmmakers and artists, but but also to you know rethink the things that we just assume are the way because um, obviously uh, we all have a lot to to learn still. Yep, and and actually, I'll come back to a talent question there as well. But there's a very natural uh, connection to something else that I think uh, people who followed your work really have always found inspiring and important, which is uh, you generate naturally strong female protagonists uh, in you know uh, in sometimes in industries it tends to be the well, it's the the two guy you know buddies you know doing the adventure, and yet uh, mm -hmm. the, the 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 hero. Uh, is frequently a woman. What uh, is that? Just a natural part of the storytelling, that diversity of perspective from you. You know, kind of how how uh, how has that come up to be such a notable part of the work that you do? You know, it's it's funny. Uh, you know, I, I I've always found myself um, drawn to female protagonists and stories in a weird way. And as you were as you were talking, I was literally thinking, <laughs> this is so crazy because I think it was just because she was in incredibly cute. But I remember like whenever I would watch Batman as a kid, I was always so happy when Batgirl would swing by and I'd be like, oh, Batgirl's in this one. Like, I was always really happy that Batgirl was around. Um, you know, I remember when I wrote uh, 
Felicity, a lot of people were saying, God, you know, why have a, you know, a young woman at the center of the thing? And then when I did Alias, so people were like, wow, so why have her be a spy? Why have it be a, you know, female spy? And I was just, I, I remember thinking at the time, no one would be asking me that question if they were, they were male uh, protagonists. And, and of course, the, 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 increasingly it is, it is, you know, it's less and less uh, unusual, but I feel like the, you know, whether it's that, you know, my mother was a very sort of strong um, and inspiring figure in my life. You know, I went to Sarah Lawrence College, which was a majority female, and I'd find myself in rooms, you know, with all these women who were talking about things that I was just sort of like kind of invisible, which was sort of my MO around women uh, in general. Um, but, but also I think that there's, there's really a, a sense of, uh, of, you know, th there's something about a woman at the center that I, for whatever reason, as a as a writer, I find myself strangely rooting for her, and and even when I don't know who she is. For example, when I was talking to Kathy Kennedy about uh, working on a Star Wars movie, uh, before there was you know uh, any sense of what what would happen, um, I remember talking to her and saying, you know, I feel like there's like I can imagine that there's this young woman who lives in this world where all the stuff that we know of Star Wars is li literally the history of her life, like it's what's come before her. And I just, I, 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 who is that person and who is she? And like, so I remember that that was even the, the way in, but it wasn't an outside in thing. It wasn't like, you know, let's consider what we should, we should put a female in there. It was just, I'm just naturally drawn to it. That kind of, you know, character for better or worse. No, that um, makes a lot of sense. And it's actually one of the things I think many folks, including me, have always appreciated about the stories when back when you're writing and generating. Um, so back to the talent thing, um, one of the things that we struggle, I think, in Silicon Valley, and that's one of the reasons I, I was kind of opening to this, and I think you've talked a little bit about it, but I think it's worth even going through it here and refreshing, which is how do you maintain that nimbleness of creativity? Uh, because part of envisioning the future is similar to the story, which is envisioning like possibility, envisioning, you know, kind of it could be different. And what's mm -hmm. what are the things you guys do at Bad Robot, like culturally with each other, physical plant, exercises, uh, management techniques? Because because creativity is your you know it's 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 everything for you. It's you know it's blood. It's 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 air. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I, I, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I I think that that there have to be um, you know you have to sort of delineate um, management and sort of corporate company structure uh, and and the creative experience and there's a hundred percent a critical venn diagram um you know for me uh, personally working with people we have a you know a a, a tv department uh, a film department a uh, music department games department we have a workshop we have the good robot side of thing you know the, the, on all fronts there is you know the sort of required work to keep the company up and running and a lot of that stuff uh that gets done and 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 katie sees a lot more of that than than i do uh you know which i'm grateful for because i know 100 that's not in any way my strong suit i still don't know what is but that is not my strong suit i know that for sure um but that is critical stuff i mean i didn't even know when we had this company well in years into the company it's like you know we probably need like an hr about like really we probably have to talk about like like reviews, really? Bonuses, right? All the things that of course one does, I had not a clue. Um, but I think the creative side of things, you know, and and Brian uh, Weinstein, who's the, our, our president, has been really helpful at finding people to help do this as well. Having a company that, uh, you know, th where the divisions are open to and, and kind of in some ways reliant upon each other for opinions, for feedback, um, but at the same time, very much their own pillars of the company, and that they work with, we bring in and, 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 and hire showrunners or filmmakers that don't need to be babysat, but who are collaborative and, and open to the conversations. And that's where the real sort of creative stuff happens. So it's a bit like controlled chaos, which is to say, you wanna have sort of boxes where you know, here's that project and there's that project. And inside that box, it may be insane. It may be a mess, it may be crazy. And it's gonna probably kind of the process will be very different than that box because, you know, they're two different human beings or, or teams working on those those things. Um, and as long as I know that the people who are running those divisions in that hierarchical way are are 
overseeing um, and checking in on what's happening with those those people, um, you know, I, I feel like I, I know where I am in it. I get very unsettled when a week goes by or two weeks go by and I'm like, I haven't heard about a, a thing. And it's one of those like, like an alarm goes off in my head. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on with that? And, and so part of it is, is, is just about, you know, again, not micromanaging, just sort of understanding, because I, I do need a sense of, of, of where things are, even if they're stalled, because then we can start to solve for that. Why is it in, in, in that state? Um, but in terms of the company, I think it's, it's about trust. It's about working people and, and creating an environment where they can show up and bring their best selves to, to work, um, treating people like people. And of course, it's dangerous when you get too sort of familial because then it's like, you know, there are a lot of feelings. There are a lot of feelings out there, um, and uh, especially the, you know the millennial workers. Obviously, they've got a lot to say, and it's it's they're approaching work in a very different way than than those who's, who've come before. But but we to do our best, and we're making mistakes all the time. To embrace the fact that you don't know, which is to say, if you're working on a on a series like we, we're doing this this new show for HBO during this this crazy pandemic time, we've actually had the ability to write every episode of the first season, which I've never had before. I've never gone into shooting something where we had every episode written. And it's a gift, you know, uh, that, you know, I, I'd love to find a way to, to continue that um, without the pandemic part. Um, <laughs> but but I will say that that I also look back at things, you know, from, from Felicity and Alias and Lost um, and Fringe, actually, where there were actors who came in who are going to be on the show for an episode or two episodes. And they were extraordinary. And there was an alchemy between them and the regular cast. And all of a sudden you're like, oh no, no, no he's not going anywhere. This guy's got to stay. And and so I will say that, that in terms of being nimble, you have to have a plan, but I think you have to have the the sense of, of the, you know, the, the faith in the operation. Uh, and it is a leap of faith to say, I cannot, I cannot determine. I cannot mandate everything. Uh, I can I have to be open to what is going to surprise us and what's going to make it better. Um, and I just feel like some of the best decisions that that I've either been a part of or been associated with are those that um, listened to and were aware of uh, the better idea. And 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 I think that that's the thing. I mean, obviously, the the, the biggest, the most obvious example in my business is you know uh not too long ago you know netflix netflix used to send out you know dvds and blu-rays in a little red envelope you know it's like if you don't if you're not if your eyes aren't open and you're not thinking about what else can we be doing here uh you're gonna i think miss the miss the trick yeah oh miss the entire industry um one of the things that that you have done maybe better than anyone else i know in history there's nothing the you can rewind. say after this. No, <laughs> no we're done. Yes. Mic drop. Uh, is um, is the relaunches of of treasured stories, treasured franchises, right? Uh, you know, um, uh, Star Wars and the new episodes, Star Trek. You know, th this is something that you that you that you bring. I think it's partially humanity too, but also this kind of creativity. What's that? What's what? What's been the experience with it? What's been the process of those, the those? Imagine a new launch that that adds to this amazing history. Well, I feel like those kind of situations uh, are, in, you know, it's it's so common now in in the business for things to be revisited, relaunched, rebooted. Um, you know, to a, a point where there are things that I'm now getting calls that certain things that I've been involved with that we created are being asked, you know, can we do this? Can we reboot that? You know, um, so it, I feel like the, I, I would say this, my my approach, which is, uh, uh, you know, 100%, um, you know, uh, vulnerable to being, you know, the the worst thing possible for at least half the audience, which is to say when there is a beloved thing, there is, you know, automatically, which I get. And and as someone who is a fan of these things, I completely understand there is a an immediate defensive posture 
or or you know uncertain posture about what is this person going to do with this thing that that I love. I I feel like as someone who's been involved in a number of these things, uh, and I would include you know Westworld and 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 Mission Impossible as well when Tom uh, invited me to work on that. There's I think you have to approach it uh, from the 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 point of view of um, embracing the spirit of what was done. Um, yes, the letter of it, of course, there's canon. You have to respect that. But you have to ask yourself, you know, what is it you would like to see? What, you know, and of course, there are often, perhaps even always, um, uh, you know, various voices that, you know, are requiring certain things because these things precede you and, and you have to honor that. Um, but I think the, the, the way to do it is to approach it from as much as possible a, um, a place of, of, you know, embracing the thing that, that you loved about it and not assuming it's going to be interesting to anyone just because it comes from that thing. You know, like how is it interesting to you despite almost, despite it being, um, you know, a name or the title that you might know? Uh, you know, it, 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 I think a lot of times, you know, a lot of movies have been made where the actor that they got for the role sort of was the crutch and maybe enough work wasn't done here or there on, on what the story was. And, and and I just think you can't rely on uh, a fan base. In fact, the fan base, obviously, and you know, I have this from personal experience, they are not a quiet bunch, nor should they be. And, you know, I, I just think you have to go into that, that kind of stuff with as much passion and love for what you're doing as possible and know that whatever you do will not please everyone and you desperately want to and you just you just won't um uh, but it, it's i think it's all about going into it with anything but what must be somewhere a corporate idea to exploit this thing that is easier to sell than something else you know yep well it's 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 keep the spirit but then add a new mystery to it uh, in part, or something you can connect to, or any number of things, but but it's that it's it has that, to, it, ha it has to be additive. It has to be something that you are that that that, that yeah. is you know that that sparks to you. But um, you know it 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 it's like it's a it's a great platform. You know if there's something that you love. I mean, when you look at the Dark Knight, um, you know like the the idea that 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 Chris Nolan had that vision for Batman. You know, frankly, you know the way. Tim Burton did, you know, years earlier, like when you have someone who has a kind of sense of something and it's one of those things, it's like, hell yes. Like, like those are examples of, you know, incredibly entertaining movies that have, but in, in the wrong hands, obviously things, you know, uh, don't go that way. And, and sometimes I think my hands have been right. And other times my hands have been wrong. Yep. Um, one other um, question we're getting from audience. I know it's been many years since you actually had to pitch for business since you know having proven the work you get so many phone calls you basically hard to pick up the phone these days um, oh no but, but by the way well, I, I i'm pitching all the time go ahead sorry yes well and so the the question is 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 you know hollywood knows how to do strong pitches what are some of the lessons from pitches you might imagine would be useful for tech entrepreneurs who are coming and pitching people like me, you know, venture capitalists saying, here's here's yeah. how to imagine this company as part of the future. What what are some of your kind of heuristics or thoughts about good pitches? I, I don't know if this will apply or be remotely helpful, but I'll try to answer. Um, uh, it's a fascinating question. Um, for, for me, the, the, the best pitches are at least for story are the kind of pitches that fairly sh shortly, like pretty quickly in, in, in the conversation, give me the feeling that that I can tell the audience or the player or the user sh would have with this this idea, this, this invention, this, this notion, which is to say, rather than talk about level of detail that is incredibly inside out thinking, um, or the sort of details that I'm not, I'm not on board yet. So like, don't don't tell me like what the the details are inside the the ship. Like I got to get on the ship in order for any of the the you know the details to matter. So to me, the more I can get a sense of something in the most efficient way possible, 
so that I'm actually asking the question or that I go, ooh, I get it, or that there's a feeling. And by the way, it might be about a detail. So for example, if someone's pitching a story, it might be something very early on in the story that that just clicks where you're, you know, you 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 feel like, oh, that's a kind of a great moment. And then once you've, you know, hooked me and I've I've gotten that feeling, you can be pretty, you know, broad stroke about what the where the story goes, what the shape of it is. And 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 it's funny, like on one of the shows that we're doing now, we're doing this thing where before we even write an outline, we're having this like four page document written that is kind of what you know for an episode of the, of the show if you were to describe to your friend sort of what that episode was and and why it was so good like what's the feeling what is the thing you would say don't give me every detail pitch me the thing that you would tell your friend like this is why you have to watch that episode you know mm. with some spoilers maybe but the idea is to create an intention document so i would just say in a pitch pitch the intention version not the outline and then let the person you know like you who's going to sort of decide what goes next ask the questions because as soon as you're asking questions the questions that's a good sign yep. like you know so i feel like the, the the goal for me is to be as efficient as possible grab the person with the feeling of the thing and then and then tell them enough so they're getting what they need to know kind of but then like well how does that or how exactly or you know what's the you know methodology for like all the questions that you would you would you know, follow up with, become the conversation. And by the way, that's, I guess, the headline for this is make the pitch a conversation as quickly as you can. Because if it's just yep. a pitch and, you, and, and one person's talking, one person's listening, it's not very interesting. Get what you can out there so it can become a conversation. Yep. And by the way, the other parallel in what you've said that I also give is, is, is advice to entrepreneurs is to say, look, what you're targeting is when you get to one how does one investor talk to another about your company, your deal? So they said, no, no, it's mm -hmm. about this, this, and this. And that's like the intention that you're talking about is like, and, and by the way, yeah, yeah, they yeah. have to be engaged enough that they have to be curious. They have to be in conversation, asking questions. If you haven't gotten them yes. there, the likelihood that they're gonna <laughs> engage or be good partners is, is much more remote. Um, Agreed. And also we, we are, we're people. And, and anything that we are doing that is in a collaborative nature or, or partnership is going to be how do you, and I think the sooner you can get a sense of what is that dynamic, and it's not just, oh, I like them. It's like, oh, I get their energy. I get their intention. I get their their innovation. You know, And I just think the, the more, the, the sooner you get to the conversation, the sooner you get a sense of how we might work together because it's how we talk together. Yes, exactly. Um, so in this kind of pitching frame, one of the things I think um, I'm going to now shift to, and hopefully this will be uh, entertaining for you, um, is, you know, because an investor, I'm always looking uh, towards technologies that will be common in the future. And so there's a set of different technologies that I've thought about or invested in that I'm kind of want to say, what do you think about those technologies? Like, how does, how does, what is oh your God. reflex? Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I thought it would, I thought oh, it would be no. fun. Oh, oh God. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. This is not where our uh, friendship ends, right? No, no, uh, okay, not good. at all. Um, <laughs> and and um, and so let's start with. Uh, I've been doing a lot in uh, the future of transportation, so uh, self-driving uh, vehicles like Aurora or uh, flying cars uh, like Joby. Uh, what what yeah. what does that make you think of in the future? I mean, look, I I I I'm clearly the the. We all want to live in a world where flying cars are a real thing, just because it, it you know, I, I would just, whether it's Jetsons or, or any other version, like the idea was something. I mean, I remember being, I literally remember this moment being on the playground in, in, in uh, elementary school. And I was talking to this kid, Reed, who was telling me that they are going to be self driving cars. We were having this debate. And this was, I was in fifth grade, I think. But we were like having this argument about self driving cars. And I was literally trying to imagine. I, I, my argument was that it wasn't possible for all these various reasons. And he, who was clearly, even at the time, you could tell this kid was just super brilliant, kind of had a vision for like how, okay. Now, it's almost like saying if to the five-year-old or eight, whatever, uh, fifth grade version of, of us, one day you're going to be able to listen to any song you want to anywhere you are. Like, I don't know what kind of uh, uh, gymnastics my brain would have to go through to begin to understand how that would ever be a possibility, um, but I, I I only bring it up to say that that 
it, it's like it's like a childhood dream. So I would say yes, 100%. Uh, you know, you want to see self-driving cars uh, and and flying cars. I think that both clearly um, are, they're going to require um, the, the transition from. There's no way in hell I would trust uh, my family's life, you know, with this thing, uh, you know, in in this thing's hands to uh, putting in the destination and then turning around, having a conversation for an hour and then arriving at your friend's house. Like it's it's going to be a fascinating, uh, you know, uh, uh, transition. And yet when you see how incredibly quickly we uh, adapt and, and adopt technology into our lives, my, my guess is it's probably a lot faster than you think as long as it's, you know, actually safe. And actually, I think the trust is exactly right. Because not only the trust of, oh, gosh, is it safe to, oh, gosh, is not having it safe. Like, oh, can I get to the hospital mm-hmm. fast enough? Or can I get to, it's like, like all of these things is part of the- uh, Well, that's business. certainly that's certainly been been Elon's argument, you know, that, that it is a, a far safer thing to have this work well than to have people have their hands on the wheel and controlling it themselves. Yes, exactly. Um, so then the next one, um, in a lot of work that's happening in artificial intelligence, uh, you know, open AI, GPD-3, uh, natural language prediction models, uh, generating stories, generating conversation. Um, now, this is to some degree most close to stories and all the rest, but is there, have you been playing at all um, with this and, and has it been giving you any any ideas for your kind of lenses into the future? Well, in terms of the, the I mean, we, we have not been working with uh any you know any story uh generating ai personally but i obviously um this is something that is uh undeniably um you know here and and only going to get refined and become more and more uh, you know legit whether it's music or or uh visual art or or story um i mean look the 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 i think on one level Sure, wherever a, an incredible story comes from, bless it. That's that, that's great. You know, uh, the point of stories obviously is to move us. The 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 thing that you know one could argue that Hollywood has already for years been in an automatic, you know, almost like you know, uh, Mad Libs version of of various movies, and and certainly, I'm sure I'm as to blame uh, as anyone for anything that feels like it's it's you know a kind of cynical approach to storytelling uh i i would argue that that um you know that it, it feels pretty depressing not as like oh someone would take my job or someone else's job it's not about that which of course it, it, there's that's there's that too but the idea that you know stories are not being made to move computers to make you know to have computers the soul of a computer for you know the stories are are, are written uh, and told and and created to to move you know humanity and 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 hopefully um you know while there will be all sorts of of technology uh, and certainly like in music there's clearly so much technology that exists now that allows for someone who's never picked up a guitar to sound like they play the guitar on a, on a record or an orchestra or, or any any instrument it, hopefully whatever tools come and, and exist will be used to challenge the storytellers that hopefully will remain human uh, and and to create the the works that do move us the most. Yep. So um, so our last question, because unfortunately, is, as I always discover, I could I could talk to you for hours doing this, but we only have an hour. No, so, I love um, talking to you. <laughs> uh, but so, um, you know, storytelling uh, often leads us to, to what we, you know, as entrepreneurs, should be working on, as well as what we should be working away from. Um, what's something that you would like to shine a light on and could do uh, through your storytelling? Is there any particular kind of like how to make sure that we stay true to to who we can be as humanity and stay away from you know misfunction? Is there is there is there some kind of um, parting words of guidance uh well look i mean obviously i think if you take away anything from this conversation is that is that i you know i have nothing to say that you don't know already but i i my instinct is that certainly on a daily basis it does not take much to find examples of of people treating other people in an inhumane way and we seem to be in a moment 
where people feel like they have license to and are somehow made stronger by uh, being cruel to, to other people. And, and, and I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could all sort of point to and, and, and bring up that we all know, but I, I feel like the, yes, you can find stories of people being kind and, and, and yet those, those are never as loud as the, the stories of people being cruel. And, and I feel like we have seen, we seem to have lost a, um, a level of acceptance and compassion and, and nuance that I think is critical for us to be friends, even if one of us is a Republican and the other one is a Democrat, or, or, or to be friends, you know, depending on, you know, if, if one of us doesn't look like the other. Um, and I, I get that we are in a crazy time, and I get that fear um, can, you know, give rise to all sorts of behavior that is is perhaps, you know, stuff that, that one might be ashamed of later, but shame itself seems to have gone away. And I guess I would just say, you know, a story that reminds us that we are more like than not, um, that that being compassionate and and being good and, and and kind to each other isn't a weakness it's it's a strength and that 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 there are some inevitabilities that we that cannot be fought in terms of who we are and what's going so that the reality is we have to learn how to coexist because we're not going to exist in another way and and so i just i guess if, if i would say anything it would be like is there a story that can you know be a drop in the bucket and help remind us to, uh, you know, to the golden rule, just to treat others the way we want to be, we want to be treated. Yep. Uh, to, to, I literally cannot think of a more perfect, uh, bow on this conversation. The, like, uh, not only discover your own humanity, but discovers others and connect to it with kindness and compassion. I cannot there agree more. Um, so Bless JJ, you, as, as always, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, a pleasure and an honor um, for uh, to to chat with you, and I look forward to our our next conversations. I do as well. Thank you for having me. Really, really appreciate it, Reed. Thank you for joining us for Greylock's Eye Conversations. All past events are available to listen on our podcast, Gray Matter. You can subscribe on SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.